So hi everyone, my name is Jakob. I will be talking about custom pester assertions and how they can improve the vocabulary of your or of our tests. So in this session, you will learn how to write your own assertions and how to integrate them with pester's shoot so they look native to pester. The agenda, first I will look at why custom assertions, then how do you extend shoot, how do you test your own assertions to make sure that they actually work? Uh, we will go through some good practice, and then we will look at how to share your own assertions, and if we have time, maybe at like uh, some other modules and stuff. So first of all, why even bother with custom assertions? Or how Kevin would say, me think why it waste time say lot words when few word do trick. Because Pester already has assertions, there is some 20-ish. Most of them are pretty generic, so you can use them for everything that you want. You have should be that wraps EQ. You have should be true that wraps EQ true. You have match that does regular expressions. You have throw that does try catch, and so on and so on. But Pester is not used just for this generic stuff. It's also used for more high-level stuff, like testing your whole environment or validating deployments. People write whole frameworks around it to make sure the databases are in check, to test help, documentation, and so on. And all of those encompass a lot of steps that you need to take. So this could be like a test that I might write to check if a firewall rule is correct. And so I grab the firewall rule and I look at the object and I check, is it enabled? True. Is it in the right direction? That should be inbound. Does it allow the traffic in? Yeah. Then I want to check if it's in the domain profile, but the profile is like an enum flag. So you have to check it in one way or another. And here I'm using this type that's almost longer than my screen just to be able to like uh, call has flag on the profile, put this type in because I can just do like a string. And uh, then I'm trying to annotate the should be true with a because so I get a better error message, but it still just says I expect it true because the firewall rule should be in the domain profile, but I got false. So that doesn't really tell me that much, but at least it tells me which true of those is that. And then I want to look at the port and uh, the protocol, but I cannot get that directly from the object, so I need to use another one, another commandlet, pipe it in, grab the port rule, and then assert on it. So it's quite complex, and there are a few problems with this. So first, the first assertion that will fail will fail the whole test. So if I go here and the enabled is, uh, is false, then it will fail. That's probably, I don't know, descriptive enough. But then if the allow fails, then I know that one of the, one of the properties of the firewall rule are not correct, but I don't know anything about the rest that's below it. So the first assertion to fail will fail the whole test and I get just partial information. And also it won't tell me like the enabled pass and the direction pass. So I don't get that information because it's not in the output. I just get the single message saying action should be allow, but I got disable or disallow. And also there are some invariants that are pretty hard to enforce. So for example, if we look at the first two rules, so say we would be testing the rule to be enabled. We always want it to be enabled because what's a firewall rule with the correct properties when it's disabled? It doesn't apply. And we also said like, yeah, we will be testing just the inbound rules because we don't have any outbound rules. So we don't have to repeat it in every test. And if we would have a custom assertion, we could hide those two things and make sure they are always correct. So the people who write the test don't have to remember to always put the should be true enabled into the test. And there is also some hidden knowledge that cannot be easily documented. And so for example, Checking this flag, I can do that in three different ways. And I have some assumption around this and so on. So what I can also do is that I can use like B and the binary and operator. That's how I would check it in C sharp and give it the flag and check if the flag is present. This works very well if you do it by itself in the command line. But if you then pipe it into should be true, it stops working. 
and it's kind of like an edge case. It's weird, but you have to have some knowledge. You have to like say, let's do it this way because this one I manually proven to be successful and it works. And if you wanted to document this, where do you put the command? In every test, or you put it in documentation in your documentation file, or you can put it inside of your custom assertion and you can improve it. And if you realize like this checking of the flag is not exactly what I want to do, then you can change it for all of the tests and test all the firewall rules in the same way, all, all the things that you want to test in the same way. So overall, this is pretty complex code, and you cannot test it inside of the if block. So this would be a better assertion, at least for my taste. So I would grab the firewall rule, and then I would say, should be a firewall rule. It should be allowed, should, uh, should be in the direction of allowed, should have a protocol TCP, should enable port 443, or maybe 44380 and something else, and it should be in the profile domain. So if I can write a custom assertion that would behave like this, it will make my test much easier, and it will be much easier to express what I want. It hides the complexity from me. It fails with all available information and descriptive error messages. So whatever code I put there, it can be complicated as long as I test it. And it can give me descriptive error message like, you were expecting the inbound direction, but instead it was outbound, and so on. And it also ensures that the invariants are not forgotten. So if I put the two rules, like be enabled and be inbound, inside of this assertion, they will be always present. So it's easier to read, easy to reuse in between tests, and easy to reuse with other people, because you can just take this code and give it to someone else through a module, for example. And it's also easy to test because in the end it's just a normal function and you can just use the pester built-in assertions and test your assertions with it. So I try to imagine like in this world where we where everybody knows how to write their own assertions, what we could do. So we could do like a hash table that should have key with this given value. We could have uh, testing on objects where we check like does this object have this property with this value? And with this type, um, is this value inside of this range? Like, is it going from 1 to 26, including 26? You could also do the same thing with time, for example. Or you can measure performance easily, like say, this action should be faster than 500 milliseconds, and I want to try it 1,000 times or 1 million times and then get average out of that. Um, also, should have parameter name, and that should be mandatory and should have this type so you don't have to grab the parameter set, parse it, and so on. Maybe I'm testing REST API, and testing uh, against the object, against the response message that I get is reasonably easy, but it's not extremely convenient, because, for example, if I'm checking the return code, the easiest way for me to express the OK return code, which is 200, by saying just OK. But if I compare that to the 200 that's in the object, it fails because I expected OK, I got 200. So I might try the enum that contains this message, but then it won't work again. So if I write my own assertion that will be doing this, and I can just say OK from some predefined set, then I don't have to go through all of this hassle and think about, like, now I'm getting an integer, now I'm providing the string, they are both have kind of the same meaning, but this is more readable, so I want to do it this way. You could also check if your certificates didn't expire or if you still have some life in them. And you can have IP that should be listening on something, some port, or you should have an IP and check if it's in the correct subnet. Or anything else that you want and can imagine, because that's what this session is about, to teach you how to do it yourself so you can apply it to your own use cases. So the promise of custom assertions is uh, that your test would become easier to read, your error messages would be better and give you more information, so when then you see your tests fail on the build server, you will be able to understand what happened. You can also test them to make sure they work, and uh, maybe you are doing something that's quite generic, so you can share it with others, you can improve it together, and you can make like the whole world better like Oliver, because Oliver is sitting there. 
So he asked about this half parameter that I showed before and uh, how to write his own assertions. We talked about it a bit. He was a bit angry that he has to make it uh, compatible with PowerShell version 2, but in the end he succeeded. And now it's shipping with Pester in version 4.6. So be like Oliver, if you write something useful, share it, and we can all benefit from that. So how do we extend should? So the basic build, building blocks are a should function, a function that does the actual testing. Then you have some parameters that you can provide that Pester knows and picks up. Then you have a result object that you return back to should so it knows if you failed or not. And then you have to register the operator to the should. So let's look at that. So I have this assertion called should be awesome because it helps me ensure the facts of life. And the facts of life are that Yap is awesome. Because if you look up the official um, urban dictionary word for Yap, it says Yap is the name given to the most awesome people. They rock at everything they do. Making everybody else love them beyond limits. Yap is the god amongst men. Everything he touches turns into gold, and everything he says is true. Yeah, uh, no, I checked. <laughs> Yap tends to be the best looking people alive and dead, <laughs> and have very large. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to read that anymore. <laughs> If you, if you look it up for yourself and you scroll down to the top definition, it's basically this, but way, way more explicit. <laughs> so, yeah. In his presence, the usual exclamations are, check out what Yap is doing, he's my hero. Or, oh, Yap is so hot, I must have his baby. So, yeah, Yap is awesome, just deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's look at the code now. <laughs> I hope you can see it in the back because I made it as big as I could. So I have this assertion here and uh, yeah, I'm running the test right here. So we are describing uh, awesome and disgusting stuff. So we're checking first that it knows the truth that Yap should be awesome and it should just not fail. Uh, it also doesn't lie, so attending PSConf EU should ensure awesomeness, so this shows that we can define aliases for the same assertion, so we can get better language. And also that rotten fish is disgusting. So let's just quickly run that, run the tests, so we can see what they do. And so the first two tests pass, obviously, because they are the truth. And the last one fails because it's also true that rotten fish is not awesome. Sorry for all the Swedish people. I yet to try your rotten fish. So, yeah. Maybe I will find it awesome and update my session next year. So this is how the assertion itself looks like. Here I'm just uh, reloading Pester module so I get the version 4 and not version 5 so I can run it interactively. And then I have this function which is the should function which does the actual testing and it accepts actual value. Actual value is a parameter that Pester injects inside of it and that's what you pipe into the pipeline. In this case, we are not enabling uh, consuming of arrays, so if we pipe in an array, it will give us the whole array instead of processing each one of them. So the implementation is really simple, just an if and then we have a return object. So this return object, what it does is that it uses an object that should understand, and it returns succeeded and then a failure message. So if we succeed, we just return true, and there is no failure message because there is nothing to say. And then in the other case, when we don't succeed, we just populate the same object in a different way. So we say that succeeded was false, and the failure message is except it's something awesome but got this. So once we have this function, we have to register it with should because should picks up uh, all of those functions that are registered and creates a dynamic uh, parameter set so then you can resolve them through the IntelliSense and so on. And it also picks up the help and uh, registers it with get should operator. I will show that later. 
So what we provide here, we use this at should operator, or you might also see at uh, assertion operator. But this one is more unified, so this is available in faster 4.8, I think. Then you provide the name. That will be the thing that you see after the dash. So if we say should dash be awesome, that's what we should see. We can also provide one or more aliases. So in this case, I'm saying ensure awesomeness, but for example, an alias for B is EQ, like in for each dash EQ. And then we say this internal name. This one is here because we want to use it to be able to look up the function so we can grab the help from it. And then the test, which is the function itself. I think I will redesign this a bit so you don't have to repeat yourself, but this was like the first first way to do it when we were adding the get shoot operator so we can show you the help that you define here. And then this just links to the script block of that function. So for the test, we will be using this function should be awesome, and that way we integrate to should. Okay, any questions so far? Since we're in the simple example, no? No, I don't see any hands. <laughs> so now I have a more real life example. This should be in subnet. And I chose it just because it's easy to write down, but uh, it's probably not the best way to do this. So I have this like an IP address that I'm piping into this should be in subnet, and then I give it this CIDR notation which has the slash because that easily fits on the slides. And so is there anybody not familiar with the CIDR notation? I will explain it anyway. You wouldn't, you wouldn't tell me. So um, this 24 means that in the IP address, I always click it, IP address that has 32 bits, the first 24 bits, if they match, those addresses belong into the same subnet. And so here we can see that I have 192, 168, 1, and those represent the first 24 bits. And then the last eight bits are the address of the host. And because the mask is like this, so this is 24 bits, then again, then those two addresses belong into the same subnet, or this address belongs, this address belongs into this network. So to show it in a better way, there's this awesome page called CIDR XYZ, where you can visualize it super easily. So this is the IP address that I have. One, 170, and I can use this notation to uh, limit the networks, do not just do that on like those end parts, like I have in my demo. <coughs> but I can also make it smaller and bigger, even though I shouldn't probably be doing this in like the 192, 168 um, namespace. So if this matches, we consider the address to be in the subnet. In my code, I'm supporting just the slash 24, slash 8, and slash 16, because what I can then do is that I just split the address on the dots, and then I just compare the pieces, because that's much easier implementation, and it fits on the slides, rather than fiddling with bits and actually checking if that's correct. <laughs> yeah, it has to do. <coughs> so let's go back to the demo. So here, here I have the same pieces. This is not the correct file. And I have some tests. So I told you it's easy to test your assertions. So you usually start by writing um, like a prototype that would, for me, look like this, just to like figure out what you want to do and how do you want the end result to look like. Because then when you start thinking about it, you realize like, okay, this is easy for one case, but maybe I want to check also this, and maybe I want to check also this, and then you might want to like check, change the naming a bit, or change what you are piping in, and so on. So for me, it's easy. I want the code to look like this in the end. 
So it just should be subnet and then the sitter notation. I'm gonna reload this again. I'm just using uh, version 4.6 here because in the latest version we kind of shortened the string assertions and they just show like this tiny piece of the change, which is not ideal. So when the error fails and I uh, compare the message, it just doesn't show you very much of the message. So that's why I'm importing 4.60, but it will work with the same way with any version of Pester. So just to have a better demo before I fix it in the real public version. This is reloaded. That's great. I can try to run this test. It will fail because it says a parameter cannot be found that matches parameter name B in subnet. And that's because, as I said, should is creating dynamic parameter sets for the registered assertions. So if you see this, you know, okay, I didn't do the registration, so it's not available on should. Then I can jump to testing the actual function. So I will just first implement the test in subnet function. So I have something that does my actual tests. So it should succeed when I give it this slash 24 and it should fail when I give it this slash 24, but the IP address doesn't belong into the network. If you look at this code, you might find this kind of funny because I'm testing for a Boolean, but I'm also first testing for nullability. This is here because um, this actually tests for truthiness. So if you give it null, this will fail. But if you give null to this one, it will succeed. So this last test would start as a green test, as a passing test. And I don't want to have that for the demo. Just don't get confused by it later. And so the first thing that I need to do is that this address and this subnet match. So. I go into my code where I actually implement the function. And I already have it laid out a bit. So this is the function that I will be testing. And then I can do a little bit of regex. So, so this first part just splits the address and splits the other address with the sitter notation into pieces, so this will be like 192, 168, 1, 170. Same here, but I also get this suffix. So I'm not doing anything advanced, anything like you would normally test for this, and if you would, then just use the IP address, I think, uh, primitives from .NET, if that's correctly where this is, the correct namespace. Come on. And then I'm just throwing some message so I can show, like, this is what I'm supporting and this is what I'm not supporting. If you decide to start slowly and just start with, like, the minimal case that succeeds for you, then this might be a good idea just to avoid confusion when you reuse it in the future for something else that's more advanced. So you tell yourself in the future, like, this is my assumptions at the start. This is why this function can be simple and really easy to implement. I'm not trying to implement everything. So I throw an exception when it's not supported. And then I have this implementation of the actual function. So what I'm doing here is that I'm just checking how big the, big the prefix should be. And if it's 8, then I just need to compare the first piece. If it's 16, I need to compare the two first pieces of the IP address. And if it's 24, then the first three pieces must match. And then I'm just doing a quality check in here for the same pieces. So that should pass all our tests for this function at least. And it doesn't because I didn't reimport it. One more time. Okay, now it passes. So now I have something to start from. Now I have a function that can be integrated into the should. So that's the first test. Now I want to have an actual should be in subnet assertion. So I have tests for that as well. When I run them, you can see they fail. 
because again it says I don't have a parameter that matches this, so as I said, that means that we didn't register it. And also I'm checking if it failed with this fully qualified error ID, and it didn't. It failed with another one. So this is another thing that you should do. If you are testing your assertions, then check this fully qualified error ID, because that's what will be thrown. If I just said, like, come on. So difficult with the huge font. If I just uh, said should should throw, okay, I'm not gonna do that anymore. If I just said this, then any failure in this code would trigger uh, the assertion and it would pass. And you don't want to do that because if there is any problem in your code, then you are just saying yeah it failed correctly, but it should fail with a given error that is coming from should, so this way you ensure it will be produced by should and not produced by an error in your code. So first of all, I need to register this, so that's what I'm doing here on the bottom. So as before, I'm just saying the name should be be in subnet, I'm not supporting uh, providing any aliases right now, this is the internal name of the function, and this is the function to use, so the script block. And that should be good enough to give us a better error message for the first test. OK. So now we fail when we are outside of a subnet, but we don't pass when we are inside of the subnet. So we need to fix that. So this is a piece that I need for the later test, but I need to uncomment it right now because otherwise nothing would work, I think. No, it should be fine. So then I do this test, and that's really simple. I just look at calling through to the, to the test in subnet and passing in the actual value, and then I'm passing the subnet that I got from parameters. So if you define this subnet, then the actual value is a, is a parameter that Pester picks up, but subnet is your own naming. So that will be also available on should, because it will be included in the dynamic set. So this name is prescribed, but this one, you can choose whatever you want. You can have as many parameters as you want. This one is one that binds to the not, so... Um, it's called the gate for historical reasons, but it would be probably more reasonable to just call it not. Maybe I will do it with aliases in the future. But this is what you use to get like if the not was used. So it should not be in subnet. That's where this one will become true. And then this is the newly introduced because string that you can use to describe what are you exactly meaning in this assertion. So the negation we can skip for now. And we can look at, if it succeeded, then just return the success object as before. And then some failure messages. So I probably need to comment that out. So then I have this failure message, and you can ignore this for now, but uh, if I'm passing so the, the not is not used, I want to produce this message, and then I want to return this return object. Okay, let's skip that for a moment. Let's just start without messages right now. So what will happen now is that I will return the PS custom object. I will tell should, should that we failed, but I don't give it any failure message. So the assertion should fail correctly. We should pass the first set of tests. So let me just re-import it again. And test this one. And both of them pass. So because here we are just testing 
if we give it this IP address, it passes. If we give it this IP address, it doesn't pass. So based on where it's located. And then we can actually check for the messages. So the behavior is now correct, but we want a better error message. All right. So both of the tests fail. And the first test is checking that we produce the correct message, and the other one checks that uh, we are supporting the because string, this one. I'm providing because it should be in DMZ, but uh, I didn't get any message at all. So I can produce that by populating the failure message. And first, I will do it without because. Here, I need to pass on the thing that I produced. Re-import again and then run those tests. OK, so the first test now passes, because now we are doing the message thing correctly. We are just missing the support for because string. And there is nothing special about it. You just need to put it inside of the message. I like to do it this way, so I use a sub-expression that uh, there is no space in here. And uh, then I have an if that checks if because is present. And if it's there, it will create space because and then expand the because message and the comma. That gives me a standardized message over all of the messages in should. And so then when I call it import, Ooh, it's broken. Anybody sees what I'm doing wrong? F, F, because. Yeah, the, the message is missing from the whole, the result. I probably didn't re-import it. Let's try again. Oh, yeah, that's true. I'm just looking at the totally different case. Thank you very much. Yeah, so this one, I usually write it without this, so the negative case is the first one. So that's why I was looking at the other one, but now I changed it in here because it seemed more logical for the demo, and it got me. So thank you very much again. Re-import it. Run the tests again. And we should be passing. Great. So now I can both provide my own reasoning inside of the message as well as get a descriptive message when it's not in the subnet. And it's not very difficult to implement. I have the same test for the negative case. They will fail right now. So I will just finish up uh, uncommenting all the code. So if I want to support negate, I just do this. So if negate is present, I take the result of the previous function and I just negate it so it will fail when it would otherwise succeed and uh, the other way around. And then this piece is here because um, in the demo, I'm passing in the actual object that's coming from the get firewall rule. And uh, I cannot here, I cannot provide like value from pipeline by property name on the actual value. So I'm kind of emulating this by checking if the actual value uh, has an IP address property, not very elegantly because this would fail in a strict mode. And I'm checking if that's null. And if like the property is present, I'm taking the value out from it. So doing kind of the same work as with uh, uh, value from pipeline by property name, but in my code. 
that's one of the limitations that are there because of the current design. So here we go. Now everything should pass, hopefully. Okay, and now we have the whole whole assertion implemented in some 70 lines of code, including a lot of strings. So that was should be in subnet, but uh, there is another possibility, and that's when you are providing a data that are an array. So for that, I have another demo. I have this should all assertion that is consuming array input, and you can then take it and you can check if every item in this list is passing uh, a given script block, a given filter, or a predicate. So that looks like this. So here are some tests. Here should all, I will close everything else. And so the usage is like this. So I would have two, three, four, five, six, seven, and uh, should all checks for even numbers. So it's module of two equals zero. That's an even number. And I import it. It doesn't work because yeah, that's why, that's the assertion failing. So this line failed because I have both even and odd numbers. And it says, expected all items from this set to pass the filter, which is this, but those three items didn't pass it. So I'm consuming the array, I'm checking it against all of the items in the array, and if some of them don't pass, then I throw an exception. The implementation looks like this. The important piece here is that we are registering it here with supports array input, and that will allow you to consume arrays, and it will give you the whole array inside of the function. And then the implementation is rather simple. I have this succeeded true, and I'm getting the non-passed items into an array. And then for each item inside of the actual value, I'm invoking it with context in a quote. If you were on my yesterday session, you might guess why this wouldn't work. Because if we put this inside of a module and invoked it like this, so invoking this, defining this variable that is like automatic above it, and then invoking this filter, then if the filter is bound to a different session state, this variable would be defined, but in a totally different session state. So if you want to do this, you want to use this invoke with context on a script block. That's a method that I think is available from PowerShell version 4. Or if you want support from PowerShell version 2 up, you can use this stuff that I published, which pretty much does totally the same thing like this, but in a way that takes session states into account. And so then if we find uh, an item that doesn't pass this filter, we set succeeded to false because we wanted all of them to pass and we add it into a list. And then we just look at succeeded, we return true, no failure message, or if we have some items that didn't succeed, we count them, we add them like to this message, expand them, and formatting the messages is kind of difficult when you have a lot of data because you want to, um, you want to show everything that you can, but you don't want to show a list that has 200,000 items to the user. Like here, expecting all items from 200,000 items to pass the filter, this filter, and then another huge set. You don't want to have that in the output, I think. And then we just register it, as I said, with this support array input. So play with this, it's pretty nice. So some good practice that I would want to talk about um, what we are doing right now in Pester, and this is up for discussion, so if you have suggestions for this, um, totally open, just create an issue on Pester, and we can discuss it there. So what we do inside is that we name our function starting with should. The problem with should is that it's not an approved word, but if you're sharing your assertions, you don't have to publish them from the module. So then it won't give you error messages or warnings. You should also provide comment-based help with examples so it can be looked up by get should operator. So that's one thing that I forgot to show. 
if we go here back to should be in subnet okay we re-import it then what you can do is get shoot operator and you will get this list that's not very nicely formatted in here because the zoom because of the zoom and you get list of all the available shoot operators that are in tester that are registered and you can use get should operator name be and subnet and you get the help that's picked up from the function so you can provide help that integrates with this with this commandlet to look up the help that's associated with the should operator you can show examples and uh, examples of negative cases and so on also, one thing that you might notice I'm doing is um, reloading the module all the time. And that's because there is uh, no function for removing the assertions right now, because you need to unregister, unregister them from all the dynamic sets, uh, remove them from like all the places where they are registered, and so on. So it's pretty difficult. And uh, we're working on it. But right now, the safest way is to just reload the module all the time. So good practice would be to provide command-based help with examples so we can look it up. And you should provide like positive case where you show what you need to provide for it to pass and negative case what you need to provide for it to fail, I think. Um, we're trying to use this be or have prefix if it fits. If it doesn't, you are free to use whatever you want. Um, for, the, for the failure message, all of the built-in assertions are standardized in kind of this way. So you have expected, then the expected values, but you got, and the actual value. And this is nice because you can do expected something, uh, comma, because, comma, and uh, you got this. So it flows naturally in the language. Uh, before it was expected the actual value and then it was very confusing to know like if the expected mean that's the expected value or if that means what you expected and then it's followed by actual value. So this is the recommended format that is used by the internal assertions. Uh, you should support not by using the negate parameter and if you don't support it then throw an exception that says not is not supported when it doesn't make sense for your assertion. Uh, when you're checking for failure of the assertion, then you should use pester assertion failed fully qualified ID of the error. And also you should write tests because that's the biggest benefit. The piece of code that you would otherwise just throw inside of your it, you can take, put it in assertion and test it. So good place to start in your own code base is probably to look for everything that's like should be true and before it there is a lot of code that needs to be that needs to be executed and then you just uh, check if the result is true and then you get an error that says expected true but got false. That's not very informative. Uh, look for tests that are big that have like a bigger assertion part that uh, is multiple lines looking at things like one by one and so on. And you can also go to your tests and just add not to some of your assertions and then just look at the output. If you would be able to guess like where you put the not and if this fails, like if the message makes sense for you and you can understand what's happening. Or maybe you can just easily improve them by adding because you don't have to write your own assertion to do that. Sharing your assertions is super simple. You just put them in a module, and uh, normally it would give you it would give you warnings because all the functions are uh, exported by default. So what you can do is that you say export module member function and then empty array, and it will not export it, but it will be in the session. One problem with it is now picking up the help, but I will be fixing that soon, so it binds to um, to the actual help that's inside of the module. So you don't have to publish your function, but you can still get correct integration with get shoot operator. Okay, um, am I at 45 minute mark, or I still have like five minutes? Okay, good. 
So there are also other approaches to this. So what you can do is just, that's easy to start with, just write a function that throws an exception when it doesn't pass. So no special knowledge is necessary here. You have absolute freedom of what you want to do, like how do you want to pipe in your data and so on. It's also easy to test, but one thing is that it's harder to discover and it doesn't look native to Pester. For example, I have this whole assertion uh, library called assert, but I don't see many people using it because um, it doesn't look native to Pester, it's not built in, and people ask all the time, like, when will this be in Pester so I can actually use it? So assertions are just things that throw exceptions so you can, you can write your own very easily. Are you done taking your pictures? Good, awesome. So a custom assertion function can look like this. I'm just saying assert true, assert is an approved verb so you can publish it from your module. I'm grabbing this actual value that's my parameter just called the same way as in Pester. And I'm checking if it's Boolean and if it's true so I actually get a true Boolean instead of a true fee value like one. And then I just throw an error and that will fail my test. So if I run this, if it runs. Oh yeah, there's a break. I was too clever. So when I pass in one that would normally be cast to a uh, Boolean true, I get failure. When I do the same thing with false, I get failure again. But if I pass in the real true, it gives me a third true. Uh, it gives me nothing, so my test wouldn't fail. So as simple as this, you can write your own assertion to do the stuff that you want. And uh, if you want some inspiration, you can look at my assert module because there I have like thousands of tests and uh, it's uh, a custom assertion library that does a lot of cool stuff. So maybe you can pick up some inspiration of what you want to do. So for example, what I'm doing there is that I already have this assert all that works correctly. So we have this one, two, three that we expected to pass the filter but the two items of them, one and three, didn't pass, so it gives you cool information about like everything that happened. Um, here we wanted at least one item to pass the filter, but none of them passed the filter. Or there is this special assert string equal that can be case insensitive, it can cut the ignore white space. It's just tiny utility stuff, but it's helpful at times when you need to process uh, more data. Or I have this assert equivalent that can compare whole objects. So for example, this is the expected thing that I expect. It just describes me at age 30. And uh, then I have this actual thing which describes me at age 12. And then I want to compare them. So in your normal life, you would probably grab something from your environment and you would have some specification that you need to match this actual state, so like a desired state. And you would compare them, th those two objects, and then you want to have some overview of what's not correct. So if I call this, it uh, gives me a lot of info, and it also gives me this summary which says, expected this property h with value 30 to be equivalent to 12, and that wasn't correct. Then those arrays are also not the same. So uh, expected check in English, but I got just check. Expected those languages in here, but uh, they are different, and so on. And this goes like deeper in the levels and uh, enumerates a lot of stuff. So it's, for me, it's awesome. I use it for like environment testing and uh, just testing whole objects at the same time. Yeah, so a summary, adding your assertions is reasonably simple with just few steps to follow. You should definitely, definitely, definitely test your assertions to make sure they work as they should. And if you make something that's like generically usable, then consider sharing it because then it can be imported into Pester or it doesn't have to, it can be just your module that you share with 20 other people who has like the same goal. And uh, you can improve it and you can look, all of you can look at it and improve it for the whole community. Also, I have Pester stickers, so if you want, then come and grab some. And uh, 
during the lunch there will be this uh, discussion about Pester version 5, so if you have anything to say to that, there will be like 35 minutes. It will be in track too. And uh, there is a long document where I describe all the new features, so if you want to look at that, just go to Pester, uh, click Issues, and look to Community Talk about Pester 5. It should be the first one. Or you can go to Tiny CC Talk V5. All right, and that's it. Are there any questions? No? Really? Okay. Then thank you for having me. <laughs>